1824, Mexican liberals finally crafted the form of government they had been fighting to attain since the beginning of their revolution back in 1810. With Augustin de Iturbide now out of the way, leaders began reorganizing the system along federalist liberal lines. They envisioned an arrangement that allowed significant regional sovereignty while keeping the central government comparatively feeble. During the autumn of 1823 through January 1824, delegates from the various Mexican states gathered to endorse a national charter. On October 4, 1824, that document became part of Mexico's first constitution, the Federal Constitution of the United States of Mexico. Among the signatories of that historic contract was Tejano delegate Juan José María Erasmo Seguin. The Constitution of 1824 owed much to its predecessors. It mirrored the United States Constitution of 1787, but it also drew from the 1812 Spanish Constitution of Cadiz, a liberal document by Spanish standards, the Cadiz Charter greatly influenced many state and federal officials. Undercutting Mexico City's traditional influence, the 1824 Constitution sanctioned state participation in national matters, but allowed for greater regional self-rule. Hypothetically, it removed distinctions between all races and caste. Mexican politicians learned, however, that it was easier to eliminate such divisions on paper than in hearts and minds. Allegedly eradicating class differences, the 1824 Constitution nevertheless retained special privileges, or fueros, for clergymen and soldiers. While pledging freedom of speech, it incongruously recognized but one religion, Roman Catholicism. Despite those inconsistencies, most Mexicans believed their new constitution was a vast improvement over all previous legislation and augured a brighter future. Yet others had no faith in the new government. The conservative centralistas asserted that Mexico could never achieve true unity unless and until the central government consolidated authority. Their liberal rivals, the federalistas, countered that unless the individual states seized the lion's share of power, the wealthy, the church, and the military would strangle the infant republic in its crib. Federalists, moreover, supported American colonization for the economic growth it fostered. Centralist opposed it. Labels can create confusion. In American history, Federalists were men like James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, who supported a powerful central government. Quite the opposite, Mexican Federalists advocated strong state governments, but a weak central regime. The two factions never organized into formal political parties. Rather, they were communities of interest with profound philosophical differences. In 1824, Mexicans were still trying to find their footing and forge a national identity. The centralist and federalist nurtured vastly different visions of what Mexico should be and each sought to define the national soul. Their altercations shaped Mexican politics for the next four decades and placed Texas on the path toward revolution. Back in Texas, American colonists read Mexican proclamations with mixed emotions. During the Spanish colonial period, the province of Tejas, which one disgusted official 
reviled as more remote than Lapland, had proven an administrative nightmare. It was, furthermore, a nightmare that the Mexican Congress inherited. On May 7, 1824, it addressed the problem by simply fusing the troublesome region with Coahuila to establish the hybrid state of Coahuila y Tejas. Yet, it neglected to stipulate a border, leaving the question of Texas's southwestern limits wholly unanswered. Erasmo Seguin resisted the legislation and attempted to maintain a separate identity for Texas. Yet, the citizens of Coahuila, who greatly outnumbered those in Texas, easily brushed aside Seguin's opposition. On August 18th, officials approved a federal colonization law. Respecting one of the major tenets of Mexican federalism, it allowed states considerable latitude in administering immigration within their own boundaries. The law did, however, impose some restrictions. Foreigners, for example, could not reside within 30 miles of the coast. Neither could they settle within 60 miles of the international, read United States, border. Mexican Federalists may have supported American immigration, but they did not entirely trust the Americans. In the main, the Constitution of 1824 delighted American settlers, and with good reason. The heirs of Washington, Jefferson, and Madison could not help but approve that Mexico had adopted a constitutional republic. At first glance, the differences between the American Constitution of 1787 and the Mexican Constitution of 1824 seemed trivial. It was true that the Mexican Congress, not the people, elected the president. Nor did the new Constitution recognize separation of church and state, a principle Americans greatly valued. But these disparities were mere irritants, not deal breakers. Stephen F. Austin and his Anglo-American colonists placed their hopes in the promises of Mexican federalism, as did native Mexicans. During the years of Spanish rule, communal loyalty to a distant sovereign and a sanctioned religion provided a sense of political and cultural continuity. Yet independence had undermined, or in some cases, entirely shattered those ties. Worse yet, nothing had emerged to take their place. Mexicans who lived beyond the boundaries of Mexico City identified with their own region, La Patria Chica, they called it, the, the little homeland. The illiterate 99% of the population found it difficult even to comprehend the concept of a nation state. For them, federalism meant that each state would determine its own destiny without interference from a far-flung central government. As Anglo-American settlers interpreted the ruling, they had official sanction to recreate American culture and traditions inside Texas.